to those parts that lack, those parts that are in need tonight, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. You make it easy, Lord. We love you tonight, God. We love you tonight, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, there's healing in the house right now. Healing virtue flowing. your stripes we are healed ushers if you'll please come thank you Jesus God you're able Lord you're able Lord we praise you Jesus thank you for your blood Lord amen good to see Eric and Christina here tonight with Grayson James Baldwin right He's doing well. You're doing well. Why don't you stand? Is he asleep in the car seat? Are you going to lift him up? And... First trip to church, Grayson Baldwin. Amen. Thank God. We've had a wonderful couple here for a few months and uh, they're going to be moving on brother and sister Cobb will be working in a church in Indiana and it's been our privilege and honor that you have worshipped with us for about nine or ten months I believe I want you to come both of you and greet the church and this is not the last you'll see of them I made sure that they knew that this is a wonderful couple amen amen just say what's on your heart. God bless you. Be seated. I was thinking about this uh, weekend, knowing it would be uh, our last weekend as official members here. Uh, we haven't been here long, and um, uh, really our circumstances are a little bit unusual. I will say to you this. Your pastor and his wife have been more than kind uh, to us. I was trying to think of a word that fit uh, the blessing that we have received, and it's not a common word, but it means a lot. It's, uh, it's a, the word is succor. Yeah. And um, if you look at the definition, it is both a verb and a noun. The verb means to assist in time of distress. And the noun is simply relief. And when we needed a place to land, your pastor and his wife offered that to us. And you as a congregation have been uh, more than welcoming and more than kind and have made us feel right at home. Uh, my wife uh, ministers a lot and travels and so it's not in town to come as often, but I've been able to come every chance I get. Uh, I will tell you, I have a, a truck, and every time I make this round trip, it's 12 gallons of gas, but it's worth every penny, and it has been a blessing to us to be coming here on a weekly basis. And I wanna encourage you Support your pastor. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 You, you have some very special people here ministering to you. And um, I'm not that much older than your first lady, but every time I'm here and I see what's going on, I don't know if you realize it or not, but your church is growing uh, it, it was a rare Sunday that I was here that somebody wasn't baptized. And I will tell you, I've been in many Easter service Sundays, Easter Sunday services as an apostolic Pentecostal. And 
uh, last Sunday was the first time I've seen someone baptized on Easter Sunday. And you had four baptized on Easter Sunday. Praise God. God bless you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Pastor Ratta. I have a unique situation since I've been born, and that is to live in four countries of the world since I've been born. I remember when I took the plane from England, which is the second country that I've lived in, and I am now British by citizenship, coming to the United States. I left a very thriving church in London, England, if you can believe that. It's a large church of Jamaican people. One thing Jamaican people love to do, or West Indians, they love to worship. I remember just over a year ago, I visited your church. And I, when I watched your pastor, I closed my eyes and I said, God, if you could just give me someone that could worship you just like that God just a pastor like that now I'm not knocking any other pastor but you see where I came from my pastor brother Sappleton brother DCK he is the first one up and I said oh God I, one thing I do I love to worship him the Bible said in Psalms David said and the king of glory shall come in he asked the question who is the king of glory he he answers the Lord strong and mighty the Lord mighty in battle he said church lift up your heads oh ye gates be lift them up be everlasting doors and the king shall come who is this king of glory the Lord of hosts he is the king of glory Oh, come in, King. Hallelujah. Come in, King. Hallelujah. Be enthroned in this place. Be enthroned in this house. Praise God. I'm glad the way they just ended like that because I know you're coming back. She took her text and I can't wait. We're going to continue to let the Lord have his way in this relationship. Amen. I believe that we've been blessed by them being here, and thank you so much. And we've also been blessed this week by Dr. Jeffers being here since Wednesday. Just one moment. We're going to do that, but we're going to do it better than that because the Bible says that those that labor in the Word, you'd have to be twice dead plucked up by the roots to understand Dr. Jeffers hasn't labored in the Word the way the scripture just flows out of him. And I want to give him honor because the Bible says give honor to whom honor is due. I think we should stand and just clap unto the Lord and thank God for a man of God who has labored in the word. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your man of God that has labored in the word and has given himself to the study of the word to the pursuit of your presence, oh God. I pray that you would bless him now, God. With virtue and renewed strength, pour back into him, Lord, everything that he has expended here and more in Jesus' name. Would you just extend your hands and we're going to pray for Dr. Jeffers that God would continue to lead him, use him, protect him, and keep him. Amen. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, for our friend. I pray, God, that you would protect him and keep him, lead and guide him, Lord, every step of the way, Lord Jesus. I pray, God, a hedge of protection around him. Keep him in the name of Jesus Christ. Use him for your glory. Continue to use him for your glory, God. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Take him to the places, God, that you have foreordained that he would go. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Remain standing as he comes. Take your liberty. In Jesus' name.
You have your Bibles open right now to Colossians chapter number 2. How many brought their Bibles tonight? Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, now I can feel like I'm in an apostolic church. That's good. Amen. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15 of the writings of the Apostle Paul to the church at Colossae. And he's giving us understandings. Verse 14, as he speaks, and he says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Now, now what he's literally telling us is that there were legal documents indicting us that proved that we were guilty of all charges. He picked up those documents, put it on himself, took the punishment for it, and so doing, nailed it to the cross and got it out of our way. Hallelujah. I don't know what makes you shout, honey, but you, just give me a moment here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I, I want you to hear this from the Amplified Version of the Bible. Having canceled and blotted out and wiped away the handwriting of the note or the bond with its legal decrees and demands which was in force and stood against us, hostile to us. This note with its regulations, decrees and demands, he set aside and cleared and completely out of our way by nailing it to his cross. Give somebody a bumper with the fist and tell them, you know I'm free. <laughs> you know I'm free. Verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. I want to speak to you tonight on this subject, the cross. The cross as you sit your Bibles down and you lift your hands unto him one more time oh come let us adore him Christ the Lord you can sing that for us please sing that no no I want you to sing it sorry sir my boy I want you to sing it Would you adore him right now? Oh, come, let us adore him. For he alone is worthy. Come on, sing. For he alone. For he alone. He alone is worthy. Yes, he is. For he alone. He is worthy. Yes, for he alone. He is worthy. 
and I'll give him all the glory. Lift your hands and sing it. I'll give him all the glory. God bless you. Thank you. As you are seated in the wonderful presence of the Lord. Thank you, Brother Conan. Thank you. The cross. As I was stating this morning and want to reiterate now, I, my mind is blown over the fact that we as people of God can be safe for so many years and never do a study on the cross. I've talked with people, I've traveled, talked with leadership, and it is amazing to see and to hear people that love God, that have certain knowledge of God, but have never taken time to study what God did for them on the cross. The cross is the central figure of our salvation. We have nothing without the cross. Hallelujah. The cross did for you and me what we could never do for ourselves. And unfortunately, when most of us talk about the cross, all we know is he removed my sins or he healed my body, and that's all we really understand. But he did so many things for us at this cross. And because we don't understand all that he did at the cross, the devil is able to get away with things that he should never be able to do in your life. He should never be able to get away with the things he does. If you understood the cross. Amen. Amen. If you recognize the cross and understood what the cross did for you, there are certain things and certain mentalities you could never accept. Now let's take a look at some of this of the cross. And let's gain some understandings. Colossians the Apostle Paul starts in verse 14, in which we've read, and I want you to see this again. He's telling us that there were legal documents against us. Now what this means is, our sins were recorded even before we were born. Recorded. How can they be recorded? For knowledge of God. God knowing what you would do before you ever were born is able to record that. And it stands as a legal document in the courts of heaven against you. What he did at the cross was to pick up those legal documents, bring it to the cross, and annihilate them. Now, you can't believe that and accept that and keep feeling guilty. You cannot believe that, accept that, and beat yourself up because of things that you have done wrong. When you believe that and accept that, you have to tell the devil, shut up. Say it was taken away at the cross. Now let's walk through some understandings of the cross. 
Let's go to what we looked at this morning, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. The cross did many things for us. And I'm just going to skim some of the things the cross did. I'm going to challenge you to study it yourself. Amen. How do you call yourself a child of God and don't even know what he did? How do you call yourself a Christian and don't even understand the cross? The cross is mandatory learning. Because everything is based on the cross. The hymn said, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And my burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I'm happy all the day. Somebody shot the cross to that. Hebrews chapter 2, we're looking at verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power over death, that he is. All right, so now you have to understand this. What God did was to take an ugly stick called the cross and whoop the devil. He left him sucking soup through a straw. Daddy got mad. Let me just put it to you straight. Daddy got mad because the devil was beating up on his kids and daddy came to handle business. You ain't going to whoop up on my kids no more. You ain't going to hurt my children. I'll, I'll smack the taste out your mouth at the cross. Now, if you understood this, that the devil has actually been destroyed. Now, well, let me let me not jump ahead of myself, but let me see do what he says first in verse 14. He said that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. Now, so he went to go destroy the ones who had the keys of death and hell. So he went to destroy the devil. Everyone say, Jesus destroyed the devil. Now, if you want to give the devil credit, he'll take it. The devil's in my house. The devil's on my back. The devil's on my trail. Honey, listen. You are dealing with a defeated foe. Now, he's not going to be defeated in your life until you accept he's defeated at the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when you accept that he's defeated the cross, you can tell him, read the hand, because the mind's busy praising God. That's why when you lift your hands and the devil tells you you're not worthy, just say, shh, up, Houdini, poof, be gone, read the hand, because I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. I don't got time to explain to you why Jesus wants to touch me. I just got it like that. I don't have to explain to you how God, why God is good to me. I just got it like that. That. Some of you want to get into an argument with the devil and try to explain to the devil why God wants to bless you. Honey, just lift your hands and point to the cross and say, I just got it like <sighs> So he went to destroy the devil. Everybody shout at the cross. Now, We'll come back to Hebrews 2 in just a moment, but go to Revelation chapter 1 and look at verse 18. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Now, don't lose your place in Hebrews chapter 2 because we're coming back there. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Now, the cross is the ultimate solution. You hear me? There's not one more thing that God must do. The cross handled it all. For everything that you have faced, everything you are facing, and everything you will face, the cross took care of it all. Yes. 
Someone shout, yes, it did. Yes, it did. Now listen to what he says. Verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys. Now maybe you don't understand. How could he through death destroy he who had the power of death? Well, this is why. By dying, he was given entrance into the domain of Satan. By waking up, <laughs> he went walking down the domains and said, um, right there, give, right here, give him to me. You threw your best shot at me, which was death, and it couldn't hold me. Give up, give the bounty, give the bounty. I, I want the keys. Now, keys is not some literal key, honey. Keys essentially means the authority. A key locks, a key has authority to open a door or to lock a door. So a key can lock you out or a key can lock you in. So when he says you feel like you're in living hell, he said, I've got the keys to let you out. And when everything else is around you dying, he said, I got the keys to that too. I can open the door and let you in. You say, how can I get out of this hell hole? Can you hear the keys slapping on his leg as he's walking towards you? Sometimes you just got to be still and know that I am God. Can you hear those keys as he's walking towards you? Sometimes you just got to be still and know that I am God. You can hear those keys slapping his leg as he's walking towards you because he's got the power to let you out. Someone say, thank you for the cross. I'll come back to Hebrews chapter 2 where we were. We're now looking at verse 15. You must also understand what the cross did. Now the cross destroyed the devil. The cross gave Jesus the power of death and hell. And the cross also, in verse 15, and delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The cross destroyed the fear of death. Every fear is linked to the fear of death. The fear of death is the grandfather of all fears. So that's why he just went after that one fear, because it's the source of all fear. And by destroying the source of all fear, he destroys every other fear below it. You say, how can I not be afraid, cross? I don't know why you think a nightlight can handle what the cross already did. Huh? You afraid of the dark? You better get a revelation of the cross. The cross handled the boogeyman. Because in case you didn't know it, the boogeyman was just a devil in another disguise. The cross handled the boogeyman. The, cro the cross destroyed him. The cross liberated you from your worst nightmares. The cross loosed you from the bangs of death. where you were chained and you were bound and you could not lift your hands even if you wanted to the cross destroyed the yokes destroyed the chains empowered you to lift your hands empowered you to open up your mouth empowered you to give God glory thank God for the cross Let's come and look at a moment to the, the book of Luke, or excuse me, Matthew. Here's something about the cross. Now, here, here's one of the problems that we are running into regarding the cross, that because we do not understand the revelations of the cross, we accept a lot of stuff that the devil should not be placing on us. Somebody lift your hands and say, no more. Now, come here and understand this from Matthew chapter 27 and verse 5. Matthew chapter 27, verse 5. Now, I'm just being honest with you. I'm not trying to sound all deep and wonderful. I'm just being real with you. Recovering surfaces about the cross. Because a lot of you really don't get all that the cross did. I mean, I'm telling you. <laughs> the cross paid for everything. 
The cross paid for your joy. The cross paid for you to get a personality. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Mm, yeah, the, the cross handled that. You don't have to be Mr. Cardboard. The cross paid. <laughs> now listen to verse 5. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Now this is speaking about Judas. Judas went and hung himself because he recognized that he betrayed innocent blood. And why he really did this is the understanding would appear that Judas really thought that by pushing Jesus, Jesus would have defended himself because he saw Jesus use his power and use his authority. And he was more than likely hoping that by pushing Jesus, Jesus would defend himself, get into power, and then Judas would also be able to reign with him. Instead, Jesus surprised Judas and did nothing. And when he recognized that Jesus was not going to defend himself and that he would end up dying, he throws the silver down saying, I've betrayed innocent blood. Uh, you say, well, what, what are you trying to get at? Well, come down further into the text so that you can see this for yourself and um, gain understanding. Everybody say, Judas hung himself on a tree. Now, let's go to verse 33. Verse 33 of the same chapter, and when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is say, a place of the skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. When he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. Now, 35, and they crucified him, parting his garments. Now, they crucified him on a tree. Are you, I don't know if you're catching this. Almost simultaneously, while Judas is hanging on a tree, Jesus is being crucified on a tree. See, what a lot of you don't get, and this is why, because you don't understand the cross, what many of you do when you beat yourself up and you're feeling guilty and you're feeling condemned, what you, you do exactly what Judas did. Rather than letting it get crucified to the cross, you hang yourself on a tree. Look at your neighbor and say, wrong tree. See, when you beat yourself up and you, see, a lot of you don't understand, you whip yourself. And what you're, what you're actually saying to Jesus is, your whipping is not sufficient to handle my sin. Therefore, I must whip myself to add to your whipping to make it sufficient to handle my sins. See, when you accept what he did at the cross, honey, you have to accept the forgiveness and you have to look up the devil and say, I am free because it was paid for. I did not earn it. I am not worthy of it. I have, but I do have rights to it. Because I've been given the rights from the cross. Someone say, thank you, Jesus. So now what happens at the cross, what happens to many of us is because you do not accept what Jesus did at the cross, you allow the devil to cause you to abuse yourself. You allow the devil to make you feel stupid. You allow the devil to make you come into shame. You allow the devil to make you come into low self-esteem. You cannot, I repeat, you cannot have low self-esteem and accept the cross. It is absolutely impossible that the God of glory would lay down his life for you. Honey, if that doesn't show you value, I don't know what does. Hallelujah. Somebody lift your hands and say, thank you for the cross. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 4. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 4. We're just skimming some things about the cross now. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 4. Now, he, this is God talking to Israel, and he says, Fear not, for thou shall not be ashamed. Uh, not be ashamed, that's a present tense. So presently, God said, I'll handle your shame. Neither be thou confounded. That means you, should you don't need to become confused or depressed. For thou shall not be put to shame. Put to, that's a future. 
position. He said, you don't have to, I'll handle even your future shame. Watch this. For thou shall forget the shame of thy youth. The stuff that you did when you were young and stupid and you thought you was big and bad enough to do whatever you wanted to do and you grew up and got a little bit of sense and realized you never should have done that stuff. He said, even that, I will cause it to be released from you. He said, neither shall thou remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, you got to look at verse 5 to see what that means. For the Lord, thy maker, is thy husband. He said, widow means you acted like I was dead. You acted like I was not there to protect you. Therefore, you had to protect yourself. You acted like I was not your husband. You acted like a widow. And you did some stuff was foolish, independent of me. And you got a reproach for doing it. And he said, even that I will remove from you. What are you doing feeling guilty? What are you doing feeling condemned? What are you doing beating yourself up? How can you feel insignificant when the God of glory laid his life down for you? He thought you worth enough to die for. Isaiah 53 and 5. Now, this, these, these scriptures are pointing to the cross. And that's what we're dealing with with Isaiah. Isaiah was known as the eagle-eyed prophet. He looked down the line of time and began to prophesy and tell things that God would do. And so that Isaiah 54 and 4 was ultimately fulfilled at the cross. God said, I'll take care of past, present, and future shame. Here's the saying. He came to turn my shame into fame. Now you say, how is it fame? Because he gave me his name. <laughs> I'm a poet, I know it. So he, 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 the word name actually speaks of fame. So when he gave me his name, he gave me his fame. So he turned my shame to fame. Now you have a choice. You can keep, keep, you can quit letting, you can allow the devil to keep making you feel ashamed and beat yourself up and let the devil beat you up. Or you can tell the devil, I don't have that shame no more. I've got fame. That's who I was, but that's not who I am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said, I'm free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. No longer bound. No more chains holding me. My soul is resting. It's just a blessing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Isaiah 53 and 5. Now you say, well, brother, you don't understand how I grew up. You don't understand... People used to call me stupid or fat or ugly. You don't understand how I was treated by my family. And this is why I have low self-esteem. God's response to you is this. He is not denying that these things happen to you. He is not trying to call them a figment of your imagination. He's not calling them an elaborate 3D hologram. But what he is trying to tell you is the cross is greater than what happened to you. Hallelujah. The cross has the power to remove the pain. The cross has the power to remove the effects of every bit of damage that was done to you and to make you anew. And it's up to you to accept by faith what the cross has done. How can you accept the cross and then try to give this story that your past is the reason why you are now? The reason why you got this twitch and you a little demented is because of what happened to you and someone did this to you. Hold on here. The cross comes along and wipes the slate clean and starts writing what God says who you are. 
You say, I was molested. Well, let me introduce you to the cross. The cross can go right down to that dirty feeling that you have that came from that violation that makes you feel nasty, that you can't scrub off no matter how hard you try. But the blood which gives me strength from day to day, it shall never, ever lose its power. I said it reaches to the highest mountain and it goes to the lowest valley. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, we don't believe the cross. There's no way you can believe the cross and have all these issues. You can't accept the cross and have all this stuff. Some of you are just so stiff. My God, you're from the first church of the Frigidaire. Some of you are cold and a few of you are frozen. We call you the chosen frozen. And God's going, hold up here. How is it that you can't hardly even lift your hands or open up your mouth? How is it that you're going to tell me that your personality is this way? How is it that you're going to declare that you can sit amongst the congregation of the righteous who are praising the name of God and you can just sit there and look like a deer in headlights? You don't understand the cross! Because if you understood the cross, baby, we couldn't hold your praise. If you understood the cross, we couldn't hold your dance. If you understood the cross, we couldn't hold your shout. You shout right in the devil's face. You look at the devil and say, you did this to me, you did that to me, but look at me now. I'm free. You tried to kill me. You tried to wipe me out. But the cross. It was up to you. I wouldn't even be alive. I wouldn't be in my right mind. But it's not up to you. The cross. You better clap your hands like you're going to clap them off. And tell God thank you. Open your mouth while you're clapping your hands. Clap your hands, oh ye people. Shout, 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 shout unto God with a voice. All right, hold on. Hold on, because some of y'all playing patty cake up in here, so hold up. Let, 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 me, let me get to Psalm 47. I, 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 if the Lord permits, I'll come back to Isaiah. But go to Psalm 47, verse 1. Listen, because, see, we quote these scriptures, and somehow we, don't, we seem to miss them. Psalm 47, verse 1. We, we quote these scriptures, and somehow, again, if God does not help us, we miss what they mean. You've got to understand that the people of the Old Testament were looking towards the cross. And many things that they talked about really were in reference, they were totally fulfilled at the cross. They had an impact for their time when they wrote it, but you must understand the ultimate fulfillment of many things that they wrote really came to us <laughs> through the cross. <laughs> now listen to what he said. Now he said, oh, clap your hands, all you people. Now hold on, watch this. See, because a lot of you do this. And you want to call that a praise. God calls that an applause. Clap your hands, all you people. Now, he said, in order for it to be a clap, in order for it to be a praise, you have to clap and do what? Shout. Now, no, but hold on. It's not just any shout. Now, hold up. you got to watch this now because I'm telling you, we quit, quit quoting this and we keep missing it. It doesn't shout, say shout unto God with the voice of victory. So now, wait a minute. You told me to shout with the voice of triumph. Now, what's the difference? Victory is when you win the battle. Triumph is when you celebrate it. He said, if you understood the cross, you would clap your hands and shout because you're celebrating the victory. 
the victory you won for me at the cross. You can be cute about it if you want to, baby, but I know where I came from. I know I was almost twice dead, plucked up by the roots, but the cross. Shout, 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 shout. Touch the person beside you. You're going to ask them this question. Hey, what didn't the cross take care of? Answer them. Say, it the cross took care of everything. There's nothing the cross didn't take care of. You hear me now? The devil can't defeat it. Hell has no match for it. The cross. Hell has no answer for the cross. <laughs> Give somebody a high five and say he's talking about my victory. Give us a fresh revelation of the cross. This isn't just an Easter story. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5. Now, now again, the prophet is looking ahead down the line of time. And he's already prophesying regarding the cross. Now I want you to see this because he talks about Jesus in third person. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5. But he, again this is one of the stuff we quote, but we seem to miss again what he's telling us. I'm telling you, what you need to do is go over some of these familiar scriptures and ask God for some revelation. You've gotten so used to quoting this stuff and hearing this stuff and you think you know what it means. He has, thank you. He did that at the cross. In case you didn't hear him, he said, bless him, Lord. He was talking about me. I just let him know. He already did that. That was done at the cross. But, but he was wounded for... No, 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 no. Hold on. No, no, no. You're really not catching this. Hold on. Hold on. Let me, let, let me break this down. He was wounded for our transgressions. He's bruised for our what? Now, transgressions and iniquities has to do with the region of the spirit. It is a spiritual offense. So what the cross did was first go after my spirit and purge my spirit from iniquity, which is lawlessness, because I was prone to do wrong. Even when I wanted to do right, I couldn't help myself. I enjoyed doing wrong. I enjoyed sinning. And don't you look at me like you don't understand what I'm talking about. Because it's talking about you too. We enjoyed sinning. We enjoyed doing wrong. We couldn't loose ourselves from lawlessness. But the cross. Moved iniquity. It moved transgressions. Transgressions means we have transgressed or gone against God. We've gone against the grain of God. May I put it to you this way? It's like trying to go up Niagara Falls. Yeah, that's what we were doing. Yeah, 
yep, yep, say stupid. That's right, we were. We were trying to go up Niagara Falls. We were trying to go up against God. Transgress. We were opposing, going the opposite direction. We were going upstream. The cross annihilated the transgressions that we committed and put us in the flow of God that out of your belly flows because it now flows from God through you because the cross puts you in line with the flow of God. When I was flowing against God or trying to go against God, now the cross made me flow with God. Hold on, hold on. Wounded for our transgressions, proof for our iniquities. Chastisement of our peace. No. Chastisement of our peace. Everyone shout peace. peace. Now you have to understand what he's talking about. Now hold this scripture. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3. You have to understand what he's talking about here. All right. Now it's good for us to get excited about the cross. Good for us to understand the cross. But listen. When you will go home and stuff starts happening to you, you got to start learning how to reach for this cross. And I'm not talking about some little gold thing around your neck. Some of you watch too many vampire movies. That holding up some little wooden cross is going to ward off demons. Get serious. The devil looks at that and goes, yeah, and? <laughs> the devil goes, I like you because you're stupid. <laughs> you easy to take down. <laughs> you think some piece of wood is going to stop me? Come here, God. <laughs> Let's you and I get together more often. We can have fun. <laughs> See, you don't have Revelation. It's cursed every man that hangs on the tree. It's not the actual physical cross. It's the man that's hanging on the cross. That's why if you just hold up a cross, that don't mean nothing. It's that you got revelation on the man who's hanging on the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, remember, remember, the chastisement of my peace was upon him. So thou will keep him in perfect peace. Who is what? Now, so go back to Isaiah 53 and 5. What he's trying to tell me now is the chastisement of our peace was upon him. What he's telling me is he died for my peace of mind. You've been having trouble with your mind? Cross took care of it. You've been having trouble with your memory? Cross took care of it. Some of y'all making jokes about your mind rather than claiming the cross. I have a photographic memory. One problem, I ran out of film. <laughs> cross handled your mind. You say, how can I have peace of mind when everything's wrong with me? Cross paid for it. See, what he's really trying to tell you is the peace of mind, this deals with your soul. The Greek word psych, soul. It deals with psych is mind, like psychology is the study of the mind. So what he's trying to say is when he died for you, he went after your soul. So the, the bruise for the iniquity, the transgressions and the iniquity, that's your spirit. Chastising of peace uh, was upon him. That's your soul. So the cross also went after your soul. And by his stripes we are? That's your body. Do you, see, we quote this and don't get it. This took care of spirit, soul, and... Who took care of all of you? You go to a psychiatrist and he normally handles your soul. You go to a medical doctor and he handles your body. You go to some guru and he handles your spirit. But God said, let me just take care of all three right here. Once and for all. At the cross. First Thessalonians 5, 23, so you can see it. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now, see, you must understand this. When you start understanding what the cross did for you, then you start looking up the devil and go, you know, this is some stuff I'm not accepting anymore. I am tired of running into my sleep like OJ running, running in the white Bronco. I ain't doing it. <laughs> it's 
Some of you wake up. <gasps> Some's always chasing you. Huh? Wake up with night sweats and you, you wake up and your, car, your cover's on the floor and you know you had them double tucked. He's running all night long, all in the sheets. You had a revelation of the cross. Whatever's chasing you, turn around and say, in the name of Jesus. You don't chase me, I chase you. <laughs> Because the cross turned the tables. I was the prey, but now I'm the predator. Oh man, if you understood that, that's why the Bible says after that, the Holy Ghost comes, you shall receive power. The Greek word is dunamis. The Bible said the kingdom of heaven suffered the violence and the violent take it by force. You're the predator. What are you doing getting hunted by loneliness? How come you're getting hunted by sickness? Why are you being hunted by depression? You're the predator. You're supposed to stand up and say you were defeated at the cross. Listen to the Apostle Paul. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, W-H-O-L-O-I, which means completely, spirit and soul and body and preserve you, preserve you blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this is what the cross did for you. The cross took care of your spirit, your soul, and your body. Now, here's where a lot of you are having problems. Well, I don't... I wasn't taught certain things, or I don't know serfs and stuff, or some things were, weren't, were done to me. Listen, honey, listen, listen, listen. You have the greatest teacher in the universe. You may not have had a proper father, now you're trying to be a father. Hello, our father, which art in? You have the ultimate father. What do you mean you don't know how to be a father? Watch him. You say, well, I, I, didn't a good role, I didn't have a good role model as a husband. You know, well, really? Okay, fine. Watch him. That's right. That's right. You don't get no better than this. The buck stops here. <laughs> He's the ultimate husband. He's the ultimate lover. He's the ultimate father. Yes, he is. Yes. Well, what do you mean you don't have a natural example? You have him. Yes. Don't you see daddy going to get crucified for his children? Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands right now and just worship him a moment. Now, you, you got, somebody needs to lift their hands and ask God to help you to believe the cross. That's what you, you know what? I need to believe the cross. That, that's what's going on. I need a revelation of the cross and I need to believe the cross. Now watch this, watch this. Go to St. John chapter 19, verse 30. St. John chapter 19, verse 30. This is now Jesus hanging on the cross. We're going to look at his words. You got to hear from him. Of course, all of it's the word of God. All of it is him. But I want you to hear it from him when he's hanging on the cross. St. John chapter 19, verse 30. And I just want the three words that he says. It is, now hold on, this isn't just some swan death scene that deserves an Academy Award because of the poetic language while he's dying. Now you got to go back to something so you understand what's going on. This is, a pro this is 3 p.m. when Jesus is saying this. Now, 3 p.m., well, what is happening at 3 p.m., you've got to really back up. At 9 a.m., when he's being crucified, what happened was at this time, the Passover lamb was being tied to the altar. Jesus, being the Passover lamb, is tied to the altar, which is the cross. 
At 3 p.m., the high priest lifts his knife, cuts the lamb's throat, and declares, it is finished. Jesus is the high priest, so he declares, it is But hold on, Jesus is also the lamb, the offering. So he says, unto you, Father, commend I my spirit. So he's both high priest and the offering. Oh, my daddy's bad. (laughs) Now hold on. When he said it is finished, this means there's not one little thing he has to do. It means everything that you have need of is already done. It means every healing you need, every deliverance you need, every peace of mind you need, every bit of finances you need, every job you need, every house you need, it is all finished. He does not have to do one more thing. See, some of you act like you're waiting on the Lord. I'm, no, no, you ain't waiting on the Lord. What do you mean waiting? What? The Lord's waiting on you, baby. Newsflash. The Lord's waiting on you because he did everything he has to do at the cross. Now, now, now watch how this works so you understand how this works. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Now, I, I can tell I'm running out of time already because I just got started on this cross. I've not talked about all the piercings yet. I've not talked about the covenant yet. Uh, oh, listen to what he says. Just waiting for them to get the scripture. Thank you. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Now listen to what he says. Blessed be God and our Father of the Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with what? He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Now here's my question. If I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings, where are they? He said they are in heavenly places. Well, if they're in heavenly places, how do I get them? Because they're in So what he's trying to say to you is at the cross, he paid for every blessing you need. Can I put it to you this way? What God did was pay for every blessing you will ever need, put it into a storehouse in the spiritual realm. Then what has to happen is there's a gap between the natural world and the supernatural world, and that gap must be bridged by your faith. So your faith is the bridge that crosses over between the two worlds. The pilings that hold up the bridge, love. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, latter portion of the verse, faith worketh by love. So God says, now when you need something out of the storehouse, you must make sure that your bridge of faith is strong enough to hold up the blessing you're wanting. If the blessing is stronger or is heavier than the bridge you've built, the blessing won't make it over. But I've already paid for everything. So now what you do is you build build a bridge of faith. What do you mean? You trust me. You declare that it is done. You move to Romans chapter 4 verse 17. Romans chapter 4 verse 17. Now watch this. You got to follow me now. We're piecing things together. Romans chapter 4 verse 17. He's teaching you how to get it. He said, now this is how it works. Romans chapter 4 verse 17. And with the latter portion of the verse. But God which quickened the dead calls those things which be not as though they so God says you must call things that do not presently exist in the natural realm as if they have already existed in the natural realm why because it's already existing in the supernatural realm and what you're doing is by speaking you are ushering it out of the spiritual world over into the natural world and you are believing it now to manifest in the natural world he said now what's going to happen is the devil's going to try to block you The devil will try to tell you you're out of your mind. The devil will try to get you to go by your five senses. He said, what you must do is declare my word. You must speak what I said in agreement that I have declared that you have what you need. You say, well, now, if this thing is in heavenly places, how do I get to this? Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. So I have a bridge now that is bridging a gap between the spiritual world and the natural world. And now what I'm wanting, I'm calling it and I'm saying I need that blessing now that you paid for God to come over I need that blessing of healing I need that blessing of peace of mind it starts walking over my bridge of faith and now what I'm doing is I start to worship and praise God like it's already done that's why when you really have faith you don't have to wait for the battle to be over you can shout about it right now Why? Because he already paid for it. Now, look what he says. He has raised us up together and he's made us to sit together. Where? 
So you already have access to those heavenly places. That's why when you lift your hands and you start speaking in tongues and you start worshiping, bam, you are in heavenly places. This now gives you God's point of view. This gives you now God's understanding. This allows you now to access whatever is God is yours. And it comes over at the appointed time. If you understand that, you don't look and become afraid. You don't look in the natural realm and say, I can't see it. You look over into the supernatural realm and say, I do see it. I do see where you paid for it. I do see that you've already have it for me and I do also see that it will be here at the appointed time I said if you'll hold up he'll show up finish you said well then why do i make prayer requests if it's already finished why am i why do i request see that's why god's trying to get you understanding a lot of you want to beg god, oh god please please help me god's going what are you doing yeah. hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 god's going what what exactly you're doing why are you begging why are you acting like i'm not going to supply how come you act like you're not sure if i'm going to show up or not don't you know i've already shown up i've already paid for it can I put it to you in simpler terms? It'd be like someone coming to you and say, hey, look, um, I went down to Sears and I bought you a washer and a dryer. Paid for it. All you got to do is go down to Sears and pick it up. All right, so you get on the highway and you start driving. Well, what happens? You hit a traffic jam. Now, just because you hit a traffic jam doesn't mean the washer and dryer still is not at Sears. Now, where the speed limit is 65 miles an hour, you can only go 15 miles an hour. So you've been delayed, but you haven't been denied. So God said, I know the devil's opposing you. You got a traffic jam standing here. But remember, what I paid for is already there. And what you got to do is keep on pressing. If you can only go at 15 miles an hour, honey, you do your little 15 miles an hour because I've already paid for it. It's already there and it's waiting on you. I said, it's waiting on you. I said, it's... So, what am I supposed to do? Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Everyone shout boldly. Not begging. Come on, some of you parents have this with your children. As a matter of fact, sometimes it makes you laugh. Some of you kids have this swagger. You can tell by the way they walk and they want something. And they come walking up. You the best daddy in the world. You're like, all right, what you want? All right, tell me more first, but then tell me afterwards what you want. How good am I? <laughs> you the best of the best of the best, daddy. That's all I am? No, 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 no. You that times 10,000. All right, what you want? That's what God's trying to say. Come boldly, come walking up to the throne. You don't understand what the cross did, what the cross did. The cross is, I don't, my God, I'm running out of time. I don't got time to do this. Listen, the cross is a giant swap. So he took my robe of filthy rags. Now, you got to remember in the biblical times, garments showed forth identity. When Jesus looked at the blind man and said, bring him to me. The reason why the blind man was noted for such faith is because he threw away his garments. See, beggars were known also by their garments, just like a nurse is known by his unif or uniform or a police officer is known by their uniform. Everyone's garment told their social status. So when he threw away his beggarly garment and went to Jesus, what he was declaring is, I ain't going to need that no more because once you go to Jesus, uh, touch your neighbor, say, no more begging. <laughs> You don't got to beg for a blessing. I hope the Lord touches me tonight. Because he knows I really need it. You don't believe the cross. Hey, that blessing was already paid for. Signed, sealed, delivered. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
So now what happened is the cross is a giant swamp. What happened is he took on my filthy garments or my filthy rags and thereby taking on my filthy garments and filthy rags, what he actually did was take on my identity. So he was actually punished as me. Then what he did is says, hey, put these on. Those are his robes. Royal and regal. He says, lift your head up because you're a child of the king. Now what my reward is, now that's your reward. What I should be getting, you're going to get it now. Okay, okay, let me show you scripture because, you know. Some of y'all ain't sure exactly what to think about all this. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. Get, get, get this revelation. Let me, let me uh, start to close. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. I know there's only so much you can bear. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. Now, for he hath made us, or he hath made him, excuse me, to be sin for us made him meaning jesus jesus was made sin for us did you see this so he took sin for us he took my identity he took my sinful nature he took it for me that i might be made what now i am made his righteousness it was a swap he took my sin i took his righteousness guess who got the better part of the deal See, there's no way you can understand the cross and have low self-esteem. That's impossible. He took your sin. He gave you his robe of righteousness. He gave you his identity. No, no, no. You, you really don't understand. See, angels minister to him. All right. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Angels, everyone shout, angels, angels. Minister, to God. minister to God. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. And are they not all ministering spirits, talking about angels, sent forth to minister to those who are the heirs of salvation? You don't, you don't, you don't get this? Angels minister to God. When you have his robe on, See, see, you're wanting deliverance and you're wanting help, but you don't have his robe on. They don't, they don't recognize that. They don't recognize that robe of self-pity you got on. They don't recognize that robe of depression you got on. They, they, no, 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 no. Mm. They back it off of that. But when you put on that royal apparel, whoa, they, they, they drawn towards that because they're used to ministering to God. Hallelujah. 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 If you don't believe that, then just simply look at the word of the Lord for yourself so that you have understanding to it because I want you to see it for yourself. Look at Psalms 34, verse 7. Psalm 34, verse 7, so you can see it in Scripture for understanding a clearer version of it yourself. Psalm 34, verse 7. Listen to what the psalmist said. Psalm 34, verse 7. I can tell I'm not getting to the piercings. When he said it's finished, friend, he meant it. And the angels of the Lord encamp around about them that are saved. Mm -mm, that fear him. See, those that fear him have on his robe. They encamp around about you. They surround you. Because they're used to ministering to him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you only understood this, then you'd understand you have an entourage. The greater your rank in the spirit, the more angelic host that follows and surrounds you. So you can walk into conditions and situations and feel like you're alone. You're not alone. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. 
So you go walking onto that college campus, you're not alone. Entourage. You walk you go walking into the bank, entourage. That's why you get favor with stuff that other folk can't get because divine favor ain't fair, baby. Somebody say, lift your hands, say, God, give me revelation of the cross. I want to challenge you as a child of God to study and learn about this cross. I wish I had time to get into the crown of thorns. Because I'm looking at some of you and you got crown of thorns on your head. You can tell because you look like you've been baptized in lemon juice. My God, some of you smile, you end up with a cerebral hemorrhage. Because life just done beat you up just that bad. You got crown of thorns on your head. And you don't understand what you're doing. For you to wear crown of thorns, now you got to remember what they are. I'm just going to teach you on it quickly. Crown of thorns are one to six inches in length, approximately 42 of them. They were beaten into Jesus' head until blood began to flow. What does that mean? Well, here's what it means. Jesus took the pressures of life that come and surround you from all sides that the devil beats into your head until your life blood starts flowing. And what a lot of you are doing is you're taking the crown of thorns off of Jesus' head and you're putting it back onto your own. When you start to worry, you're taking the crown of thorns off of Jesus' head and putting it on your own. When you start to fear, you're taking the crown of thorns off of Jesus' head and putting it back on your own. What you need to tell the devil is I'm leaving the crown of thorns on his head. He can take it, I can't. Tell somebody, I'm not wearing the crown of thorns. Why don't you lift your hands and thank him for the cross? My God. Oh God, help your children. Help your children here tonight. How can they have low self-esteem and understand the cross? How can they feel overcome and feel overwhelmed and understand the cross? How can they feel like a failure and understand the cross? How can they be fearful about their tomorrows and fearful about what's going to happen next? And fearful of being hurt and fearful of failure and understand the cross? Oh God, if they could just understand those three words you said, if nothing more, just those three words. It is finished. You, let me see the hands of you that have the Holy Ghost. Oh, that's awesome. Tell someone beside you, that's because of the cross. There's no such thing as a Holy Ghost without a cross. Not the Holy Ghost dwelling inside of you. What a Eli, Eli, Lama Sabathani. Oh, if I could just, my God, do you understand what he was doing when he said that? He took my. 
my identity. The translation, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, there were legal documents against me that made it impossible for him to be near me. I was contaminated. I was the one that was making that cry. But he took my identity and took the curse of separation. And then he looked at me and said, whosoever will, let them come. Anytime you want me, you can have me. No longer do you have to say, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabathne. Why do you let the devil make you feel that I am not there? When I took that at the cross and that I looked at you and I promised you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. How could you believe an enemy over a God that will die for you? How could you accept from the devil because you don't feel me? That I am gone from you. I took the curse of separation so that you could know the joy of unity of my spirit at the cross. Hey, he did a whole lot more than just remove sin, friend. You need to study. <laughs> if you would just believe the cross and understood the cross, you'd never feel. It doesn't matter if it felt like he was the next galaxy over and the devil was screaming in your ear. You would look at the devil and say, you can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. I said, I'm wrapped up tied up and tangled up in Jesus wrapped up tied up tangled up in God ye might, might not feel him but I don't walk by feelings I walk by faith and I walk by what he said that lo I am with you always He said, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabbath and I, so that I wouldn't have to say it. <laughs> my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now I can open up my arms and say thank you. I can say wrap me in your arms. And when nobody else wants me, maybe you don't understand. Parents, you know how it is when you have a cute little baby and you bring them to church. Oh, all the teenage girls and different people want the baby and they grab the child and, ooh, and they coo and play with the baby. And, but as soon as they go, this mad hunt starts going on. Do you know where the parents are? I believe this is yours. Because when you were stinking in sin and nobody else wanted you, he said, bring you to me. I want you. How could you ever feel rejected and understand the cross? How could you ever feel alone? He did what no other could do for me. He went behind closed doors and changed my stinking sinful diapers and brought me out into the public where he made me smell potpourri fresh where people can't even believe that's what I was because he changed me so well. People can't believe you are a drug addict. People can't believe you are a prostitute. People can't believe you are low 
low self-esteem. People can't believe you are a failure. People can't believe you are a loser because he changed you. What's wrong with us? always seem to want to talk about the cross is that a good Friday or an Easter you don't have life without a cross what's wrong with us how do you know more about your iPad than the cross how do you know more about an iPod than the cross how do you understand windows and don't understand the cross How do you know all these secrets about your friends and how to work Facebook and how to send pictures and how to transfer and how to paste and, and how to scan and you don't understand the greatest thing that brought you life and then you wonder why you keep getting beaten up and you wonder why service after service God has got to pour the same thing back into you and you wonder why the devil's able to step on you like a roach and you wonder why even though you pray you don't have results as you should and even though you give your tithes and your offerings you still don't have the blessings as you should because you don't understand the cross Would you lift your hands right now? I'm not done, I just quit. He's not trying to put you into guilt and shame. He died to take that off of you at the cross. He's talking to you as a lover. How do you say you love me and yet know everything all about Steve Jobs and all these other things? How, how, how do you love me and know all about this other stuff and don't know about what I did for you? Did Steve Jobs die for you? Why are you more excited over an iPad and Mac computer and iPhone over than you are over the cross? My God, some of you screamed when you got your iPhone and service we can't even get you to lift your hands and hardly even worship God and the iPhone cost hundreds of dollars and you won't even drop ten dollars in an offering you'll go pay six hundred dollars for an iPhone a thousand dollars for an iPad it won't even drop ten dollars in an offering when all these blessings from God and have no knowledge I challenge this church to go study the cross you will never ever be the same when you understand and believe the cross I don't care who doesn't like you I don't care what they've said against you I don't care how many times someone's called you a loser or a fool I don't care who looks at you like you'll never be anything. If you understand the cross, you're able to plant your feet in the bedrock of the word of God and say like the apostle Paul, none of these things move me. Because of the cross. Because of the cross. Come on singers, come on musicians. And if you don't know it's time to pray, I don't know what to tell you. But it's time for you to find an altar and ask God to teach you about the cross. How can you be more concerned about people's opinions and what someone thinks about you and whether they accept you or not? Why are you more concerned about this than the cross? <laughs> 